In July 1947, Roswell was a small, sleepy town surrounded by ranches and desert. It was also home to the 509th Bomb Squadron, which was the most elite military group in the world. They had just dropped two bombs on Japan and tested a couple more in the Pacific. America had won the war, and just when it seemed like life was getting back to normal, a strange thing happened. Something large and silver hurtled out of the sky and plowed into the desert with a bang. A local rancher found the pieces of a, well, whatever it was, and reported it to the local airbase. The government took immediate interest, and for the first and only time in US history, issued a press release stating the crash of a flying disc. Naturally, news this big made headlines across the country. Headline edition, July 8, 1947, that a flying disc has been found. The biggest who's it, what's it story of the year. Flying saucer. But one day later, the initial press release was retracted and a new one issued with a more down-to-earth explanation. And those two press releases are where the story gets so much of its juice. One day, it's War of the Worlds, and the next day, it's a weather balloon. So, the townspeople of Roswell went back to their farming, and life went on. But of course, that was not the end of the story, and some people could not leave it alone. We would never have heard of Roswell, nor would it have appeared on our TV screens for that matter, if it wasn't for the chance meeting in 1978 of two men, Jesse Marcel, a retired military officer, and Stanton Friedman. By day, a mild-mannered physicist, but by night, the world's most famous ufologist. I'm convinced after 30 years of investigation that the government recovered a crash flying saucer and alien bodies here in New Mexico. It's one of the biggest stories of the millennium. Hold on, that's quite a statement. We're going to need a little more information. Let's just back up for a second. In 1947, Jesse Marcel was the intelligence officer at the Roswell Air Base. And when news of the flying disc hit town, it was Marcel's job to investigate. Before he died, he told Friedman his story. The seed was planted and the Roswell conspiracy was born. I first talked to Jesse in 78. This is before any books were out. It was before there was a big public noise of any kind. The people in ufology didn't know about Roswell. It was de nouveau. I mean, it was, it was there, but nobody knew about it. I found one piece of metal, what looked like metal anyway. It was not flexible, but it was as thin as a fall of a pack of cigarettes. I tried to make a dent in this metal. He says, you can't bend it. You can't make a mark on it. He says, I took a sledgehammer and, and whammed it. I put it on the ground and whammed it. The, sledge, the sledgehammer bounced off of it. It was definitely not a weather balloon. And uh, it was an aircraft. So what it could have been, I wouldn't know. There was no reason for anybody to lie under those circumstances. Forgetting about the fact that if you're suggesting the intelligence officer for the most elite military group in the world is going to make up a crazy story like this, it doesn't make any sense. Friedman was hooked, and he started digging around Roswell to see if anyone else had a story to tell. Many of the witnesses he first talked to have since died. Luckily, these interviews were recorded long before the hype. I don't know what it was. It was something like balsa wood, but uh, it wouldn't burn. 
and I couldn't cut it with my knife. There's a little piece of material, and you could crumple it up, let it out, and it would come out flat. And you could not crease it. Something strange happened in Roswell. That much we do know. We also know that none of us would ever have heard of it if Stanton Friedman hadn't met Jesse Marcel. Marcel told Friedman about a crashed saucer in Roswell. Friedman started developing a theory. At the end of World War II, there were three signs to any visiting smart alien that soon these idiot earthlings, this primitive society whose major activity was obviously tribal warfare, would be bothering them. The three signs were nuclear weapons, V-2 rockets, and powerful radar. Isn't it amazing that the only place on the entire planet in July 1947 where you could study all three of these technologies was southeastern New Mexico. Somewhere along the way, Friedman developed the ability to know what aliens are thinking. But if there was a flying saucer at Roswell, it didn't land, it crashed. For all we know, it could have been on its way to, say, Mercury. Wherever it was headed, it didn't quite make it, so we are left with a mystery. There's only one person still alive who claims to have actually had his hands on a piece of the crashed saucer. And he's not your average conspiracy theorist. He's a flight surgeon with the US military. That July night in Roswell, the one I'll never forget because of the uniqueness of it, marked a dividing point in my life before the event and after the event. I was sound asleep. It was, you know, one or two o'clock in the morning. And uh, my dad came into the bedroom and he woke me up and says, come here, Jesse, I got something I want you to see. He was very excited and uh, my dad wasn't given to excitement, so this is kind of unusual for him. So I knew that, well, whatever it was, must be pretty important. He went over, called my mother and uh, got her up. And uh, he had pre-positioned some debris uh, on the floor of the kitchen. Then he said, this is flying saucer material. Then there were some, uh, look like eye beam fragments. And on the inner surface, there was, uh, I thought, hieroglyphic writing. I said, what is this? Marcel and his father had this piece of the debris recreated from memory so that they could show the world what they saw that night. The meaning of these symbols is, escapes my uh, feeble mind there. Uh, maybe it uh, says, uh, do not flush in zero gravity or something like that. And we looked at this for 10 or 15 minutes, and he's you know, telling you, remember this? This is something that uh, you all remember the rest of your life. And by golly, here we are almost 60 years later, it's still there. 